Good morning. Um, over the last few weeks, we've been thinking about kingdom culture. And this morning, I wanted to share a little bit about the kingdom culture of shining God's light in dark places. And that being part of the calling on each and every Christian's life. Um, I wanted to share a little story, first of all. Um, my husband, Ben, and I, we volunteered for a few years in Central America, in Guatemala and in Honduras. And we were with a project linked to Tear Fund. Um, and we were working with some incredible Christians who were working in very difficult scenarios. Um, there were many issues facing Honduras at that time, and many of these Christians would bravely step into situations that were dark um, and difficult. Volunteers would come and get alongside the project to kind of give them encouragement and, and boost their, their resources. And we went and joined this, this project, this ministry, and there was a, a couple of Canadian volunteers who came and they were very funny and very just full of life and would always make us laugh and, and bring the joy when we were around them. And there was one day uh, we saw one of these guys, uh, Dave, um, walking into the office with this massive pane of mirrored glass just under his arm, just, just walking. Uh, and when I asked him what he was doing with that, he wouldn't tell me, he said, it's a secret. So that's all right. And then a week later, I went into his little office space and there were fragments of mirrored glass literally all over his little office. And I thought something terrible had happened. He had an accident. And I said, oh, no, do you know what's happened? You need me to help you clear it up. What's, what's going on with the glass? And he said, oh, no, no, no. It's all part of the plan. Just, just, just wait and see. I can't tell you yet, but just wait and see. So I had no idea what he was up to and what it had to do with community development and helping fight injustice and poverty in, in, in Honduras. But he was just one of those characters uh, that, you know, I just left it to him. So the next week he came around everyone in the office and he said, would you come outside at lunchtime because I'm going to do a big reveal. Didn't say what it was. And we said, fine, okay, Dave, we'll come outside at lunchtime. So we stepped out of the office at lunchtime and that day the sun was just dazzlingly bright. It was super, super hot. And he had a big, big bag with him. And as we stepped out, he got us all to gather around and he said, look at this. And so he reached into this bag and he pulled out a disco glitter ball in the shape of a donkey. Um, so in Central America, have any of you been to Central America? Oh, brilliant. They love pinatas. So pinatas are generally donkey shaped um, papier mache uh, things that are full of sweets or goodies or treats. And at a birthday time, little kids, it's, it's lethal, little kids are blindfolded and they're given a little stick and they will be spun around lots of times until they're dizzy. And then they have to try to find the donkey above their heads and whack it a number of times with the stick to make the treats fall out. And it is completely lethal, but really, really fun. So basically his big brother was having a birthday and his brother was working up in the jungle region. La Mosquitia region of Honduras. And he loved pinatas, but he also loved glitter balls. And so his little brother, Dave, had decided to fuse these two things together and create this mirror disco ball donkey, as you do. And he'd spent hours and days piecing together, first of all, cutting up the big pane of mirrored glass to create tiny mirror tiles. And then he had spent each day just sticking each little mirror tile on to this papier-mâché donkey. And when he brought it out of the bag and the light hit it, it was absolutely dazzling. It was spectacular because the light hit the glass and then it reflected off and it created these kind of rainbow prisms and they transformed everything that they hit. So we could see it all over our clothes. The ground was transformed. The walls were transformed. It was on people's faces. It was just absolutely beautiful. It was dazzling. In John 8, 11 to 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We all, most of us will know this very familiar verse. There's something transformational that happens in us when we step into the light of God's grace and his love and we choose to follow him because we step into that light and his light touches our brokenness 
our little broken tiles and transform them into something quite extraordinary. But if we stay indoors, as it were, if the disco donkey had stayed indoors in that office, it would never have shown the way it was supposed to, because it would simply reflect whatever it was pointed at. It had to be brought out into the presence of the dazzling sun. It had to be literally postured, presented, pointed towards the light in order to then reflect the light out and transform everything it touched. Many of you might have felt this transformation in your own life. As you sit here, you're nodding and thinking, yes, I have experienced that in my broken bits. I have felt the light of God's grace, the light of God's forgiveness, the light of God's goodness. And I have felt those broken bits, those dull broken bits being transformed. And I experience that each day because I'm still broken and I still have lots of flawed bits. You've experienced that. You continue to do that. Maybe others of you long to experience that and you're thinking that sounds good. <laughs> I've got lots of broken bits, little mirror tiles that aren't reflecting anything good at the moment. And I'd love the light of God's grace to hit them. We have a choice as to what we do with a gift when we're given it. This disco donkey ball was created lovingly, but it had to be delivered to the person it was designed for. And that little brother, Dave, he wasn't able to post it to his brother. His brother was working in the middle of the rainforest. He had to travel with it, carry it with him very carefully on a rickety old bus all the way up through Honduras. Roads weren't great. Potholes were massive. There were many challenges on that journey, but he had to get it into the hands of his brother in the rainforest region. And he did that. It took around nine hours, I think, to get there, but he delivered it. Now, when his brother received that disco donkey ball, he had a choice as to what he did with it, didn't he? You know, he could have said, thank you very much, and then hidden it and put it in a cupboard. No one would ever have seen the light that it designed, was designed to reflect. Or he could have just hoarded it and thought, oh, that's a really lovely gift. I'm going to look at that every single day on my own. I'm going to hang it above my bed. And when I wake up, I will get the goodness of all of that light coming at me each and every day. Or he could do what he chose to do and hold it up high, hang it up high so that other people got the blessing from that gift, from that light. And, you know, maybe you are thinking as you sit here, Actually, I know people who carry that light, people who've been given that gift of light in their lives and they carry it and they carry it to me when I meet with them, when they pray for me, I feel it. When they share with me about what God's done in their life this week, I, I feel it, I feel that light bouncing off me. I feel it's being passed on. Maybe others of you are thinking, I don't really know anyone who carries that light into my life and I'd love to. I'd really like to know that and what that feels like. It strikes me when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That when we accept Jesus as our savior and our Lord, when we say yes to him being the boss of our life and we hand over the keys to our lives to him, then we're given that amazing gift. But he doesn't say whoever believes in me will not sit in darkness. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. So there's an assumption here that when we're given this gift, that we get active with it, that we're not passively receiving it. And it's not just about our heads. It goes to our hearts. It goes to our hands. It goes to our feet. There's an assumption when Jesus says he will not walk in darkness, that we'll be on the move. We'll be journeying with Jesus wherever he chooses to lead us, that we'll be following him. A lady got lost just um, the other day in Lyme and my friend very kindly drove her car over to see this lady who was really in distress, having a panic attack at the wheel and had just kind of lost uh, momentary kind of her bearings and, and she was feeling really distressed. And my friend simply said to her, don't panic, follow me. That's all she said. And she took her car and she uh, drove in front of this lady who had just, just panicked at the wheel of her car. And she was able to just very slowly lead her to a parking space to where she needed to go. But for that lady to get to that space, she had to keep her eyes on the car in front. She had to be tuned in to what it was doing. If it indicated left, she had to follow. If it indicated right, she had to follow. 
we are called to follow Jesus wherever he leads. And that requires us to be tuned in to his voice, to where he wants to lead us, not to passively sit and receive from him without responding. He initiates, but we imitate. Isaiah 60 verses 1 and 2 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Again, we're called to arise and shine, not recline and shine but arise and shine. And I, and my mum used to use that phrase a lot when she was trying to wake me up on cold, dark, rainy Northern Irish mornings, you know, in the middle of December, trying to get me out to school, arise and shine. And I would be kind of pulling the duvet over my head and trying to hide. It's not easy to arise often. It's easier to hide under the duvet. It's easier to have a cup of coffee and, and, and wait till the urge to arise passes. It's not easy, but it's not meant to be because God not only wants to shine on us, you know, we come, we receive worship. It's beautiful. He's shining on us. He's shining on us. Someone prays for us, gives us a word. It's lovely. We receive it. He shines on us, but he wants to shine through us, following wherever he leads. And there are people who desperately need us to shine our light into their lives if we hoard it or if we hide it they will never receive it they will never be blessed by it now i wonder how shiny you're feeling this morning <laughs> as you sit here do you feel shiny i don't feel shiny this morning as i come to church i don't often feel shiny but you know the great news is that we don't have to be shiny to shine for jesus because he is dazzling he is bright so the disco donkey ball in and of itself was not that shiny or spectacular, but in the presence of the light, it was dazzling and it transformed everything around it. So we don't need to feel shiny in order to shine. And that's great news, isn't it? Good news for me. If we're honest, I think we can often be so focused on our flaws and our failures and our foibles that we just don't feel that we're able to shine at all or be useful for the Lord. And that's exactly what the enemy wants, because what is he called? The enemy is called the Prince of Darkness. And the Prince of Darkness does not want us to shine our light. Paul says in Philippians 2 that we are to uh, shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. But the Prince of Darkness doesn't want us to shine. And he wants us to focus on all the things that hold us back. And I have really struggled for most of my life and still do each and every day with fear and anxiety. And I know that the enemy has really used that so often to hold me back from doing things because he simply says, look at the smudges all over you today. You're not shining for anyone. You're just smudgy, you know? And, and you can feel so smudgy that you just think everyone's gonna see my smudges. So I don't really want to be visible in any way because I don't want people to see the smudges. I just, I just can't shine. But look at all those lovely, shiny, dazzling people. And we look at every single other person we come into contact with and we can see how they shine, but we only see our smudges. And that's what the Prince of Darkness wants. In my own life, when I was, I, I gave my life to Jesus when I was six, and I used to read about very brave people who I could not relate to in any way. And that's why I loved reading about them because they were almost like these Marvel superheroes in my mind. Gladys Aylward, if none of you have come across this amazing woman, she went to China, she broke up prison riots, she, she saved lots of children and looked after them. She was the bravest, bravest woman. And all the odds were stacked against her. And I used to read about people like that who stepped into God's story bravely to do mission in very dark, very difficult places and things wow she's so shiny but look at me I I'm not I'm just smudgy but then a family who had been called to go and serve in Nigeria who I knew were ordinary people left our church and went to serve in Nigeria and then they came back to talk about what was happening there and as they shared their stories it really struck me you know that all they kept talking about was their own weakness and God's strength their own failures and God's amazing triumphs. 
their own lack of faith at times and how God had in his mercy and in his goodness and his grace used them despite themselves. And their humility really struck me because I thought, yeah, you know what? You do have smudges, but you're not afraid to share about them. And you're letting God use you anyway. And they'd just given God their yes and they'd said no to their fear. And I had never really practiced that. I'd never stepped into that. I'd never really let that fear be something I felt I could conquer. It was conquering me. And when they shared their story and they shone their light to me, something bounced off me. Something came into me and I thought, I want to give God my yes. I want to put the anxiety and the fear at God's feet as they are doing each and every day. And I want to serve God. And maybe that will mean I can go overseas because God had been stirring that in me, that little spark had been put in me from reading about Gladys Aylward and then hearing this family, the Johnsons, who'd gone to Nigeria. I thought maybe God could use me after all, not because I'm shiny, but because he is dazzling and he can do it. To cut a long story short, I ended up getting on a plane to go to Uganda in my year after university to go and serve in a village there and, and to teach in a school. And again, it was so far out of my comfort zone. All I could do was just pray my way there and pray each day that God would give me the, the strength to, to not worry about all the ways in which uh, dangerous, horrendous things could happen. And, and in the end, God you chose to use that year to completely transform me, transform my life and the whole trajectory of my life. But when I was there, I, I met so many Christians um, in Yarrowhanga village who had a soul glow about them. They shone for Jesus in a difficult place. They were ministering to people who had very little and they had very little themselves, but they gave all they could, where they could, how they could. And they inspired me so, so much. And my most precious possession in that year was my paraffin lamp. Have many of you used a paraffin lamp before? <laughs> Some nods. <clears throat> so if you're somewhere where there is no electricity, you literally have to pick your light up and carry it with you wherever you go, because otherwise it's pitch black. And um, I would take this paraffin lamp everywhere I went. And one night I came back to my little room and I was, was, was sort of swinging it, you know, as you walk, it swings and it casts shadows, doesn't it, wherever, wherever you go. And suddenly it swung and I looked up and there was this giant shadow of, a, of literally a giant rat rotating around my little bedroom. And it was because there was a rat that was hanging by its teeth onto the hook of my mosquito net and it was spinning around and around and around. So because the light was magnifying the rat, it was just like this kind of grisly disco ball from a horror movie and it was just rotating around. And of course, I just leapt straight back and wouldn't go anywhere near it, ran into my mission partner Kate's bedroom and said, can I sleep in here tonight? I'd ended up having a baseball net bat next to me all night in case the rat came anywhere near me. But, you know, when I think about that, it's kind of a metaphor for what the Prince of Darkness and the enemy wants to do in our lives. He wants us to focus on the rats, whatever that represents to you, the things we can't do, our flaws, our failures, our smudges. He wants that to be the biggest thing that we see so that we simply retreat and do what I did. We, we step back from where we should be and we lose our sense of purpose or calling. We don't step into our calling. We step back out of it. If I had brought the light closer to that rat and engaged with it, if I had illuminated that space with the light, I could have eliminated the rat. You see, we have to illuminate some things for them to be eliminated. But the, the Prince of Darkness doesn't want us to do that. And he wants us to stay in our comfort zone and retreat from our calling. And you know, there are places in the world where there is injustice, as we know, there is poverty, there are people trapped in all sorts of ways, people who are trafficked, people who are victims of violence, people who have never been told that they're worthy, people who've never heard the name of Jesus, people who have never seen or been anywhere near a church family, who desperately need light carriers to come and step into their darkness. They desperately need that. So if we can continue to retreat and step back, and we don't bring the light into those spaces, who will?
When I was in Honduras, I met a family who, for me, shone brighter than many families I've, I've ever met. And they were, um, he was a pastor. The, the father was a pastor and his wife was a teacher. And they had a little daughter who was only six or seven years old. And one day they went to the big city rubbish dump in Tegucigalpa in Honduras. It, it, this, this rubbish dump, if you've ever seen these kind of urban rubbish dumps, maybe on documentaries or, or TV, or you may have seen them yourself, there are literally thousands of people who live and work and survive on this rubbish dump, finding clothes to wear, finding things to eat and, and stuff to sell. And we stepped into this space in this rubbish dump in Tegucigalpa and the smell, the stench would make you want to gag. It was full of vul vultures and um, it had toxic chemicals and things just being dumped there, mixed with food, mixed with clothing. And there were little kids, there were little babies, there were animals and dogs and, and a community of people all mixed in together in this very, very dark place. And this community of rubbish pickers are kind of shunned by the rest of society. Basically, this family went into that space to dump their rubbish one day, and the little girl simply said to her dad, Dad, we need to pray for these people. And they prayed for them, and then she said, I think we need to stay, not just pray. And so they began actually to serve that community each day, going in, praying with them asking them what they needed, telling them about the love of Jesus, showing them that they were important, that they were seen, and carrying their light into that place. Over time, they began to shine a light on the issues that were facing that community. They began to tell others, you know, they need clean water. Can we do something as a church community to bring water? Or they need some food that is nutritious. They're just scavenging from the dump and getting very sick and losing their lives, some of them because of what they're eating. What can we do? And as they did that, the ministry grew. One church told another church, told another church. Prayer started to flood in. Money started to flood in. People who were builders said, I could build something and help that school, that community in the dump. The teacher and the pastor's wife set up a little school in the dump, just sitting on bits of cardboard and, and rubber tires, began to teach the kids in the dump as they were. They needed to keep working, so they would come to school in the morning and then work in the afternoon. And then over time, so many people got on board that a proper school was built there beside the dump. It now, this is now 20 years on, it has now become a nursery school, a play park, a creche, a school, a sports field, there's a computer suite, there's a canteen, it's, it's phenomenal. There's a health program, there's a, a mentoring program, and it has all come alongside evangelism and discipleship. So many, many, many people from that community have turned to Christ. And now the kids who were little when I went to visit, who have grown up, their greatest aspirations used to be to be the rubbish dump um, driver, the driver of the truck that came into the dump. That was their highest aspiration. They now want to be missionaries, pastors, lawyers, teachers, doctors, they are living lives that they could never have dreamed of and they're reaching other poor communities for jesus so the light you see has been passed on one little girl stepped into god's story of mission she shone the light and that light has been bouncing around and being carried and it's now going to many other places god needs us to be light carriers and there's a world that is broken and a world that is desperate and a world that is needy Matthew 5, 14 to 16, we're coming into land, sorry, says you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. We started off by looking at Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. But he says to us, you are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see your good deeds and give honor to your father, not to you, to your father. So we have a choice this morning as to what we do with the light that we've been given. Do we hide it? Do we hoard it for our own benefit? Or are we going to hold it up and let it shine so other people can be introduced to Jesus, the light of the world? Acts 13 47 says, I have made you a light for the Gentiles so that you will bring salvation to the ends of the earth. 
We know God is a global God. His big mission story is for everyone, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. We can get so, and I'm guilty of this too, we can get so caught up in our own little story that we forget that we're part of God's big global mission story. Where is God calling us to shine our light? Can we use a holiday time to go and serve somewhere where other people would not choose to go on a holiday? Could we choose our retirement to go and step into somewhere new and shine a light somewhere where other people have forgotten? Could we use a sabbatical time to go and do it? Or could we support others who are doing it if we're not able to do it ourselves? I work for a mission agency, as you know, called Latin Link. And it's a multi-directional, beautiful community of people sending and receiving teams and individuals and families to and from Latin America and Europe. We've got Latin Americans feeling called to come over here and serve. There's a beautiful Brazilian girl serving right now in charge, blessing the Portuguese speaking community right now, running Alpha courses, getting involved. She's at Forefront Church serving the Lord here. We've got a young girl uh, who's just gone out, a couple who's just gone out to Guatemala to serve there. We've got a guy from Northern Ireland who's been serving in the favelas in Brazil, using his passion for sport to reach out to young men who don't have father figures in that place, who don't have anyone discipling or feeding into their lives. We've got a girl who's really creative, who didn't quite know how she was gonna use that creativity to serve the Lord. She's in Peru. She's doing puppet shows to talk to children who've been victims of sexual violence, to talk to them about the love of Jesus the Father and how special they are using her creativity. She's now publishing holiday club materials that will get into the hands of many, many children to teach them about the light of the world. And so we may feel this morning, well, I don't know where I fit with that. But maybe you're called to pray into God's global mission. Maybe you're called to give financially into God's global mission so that other light carriers who are called to go can get on the plane and go. We all have different roles that we can play in that big mission story. Our little mirror tiles just need to be pointed towards the light and then let God do the rest. As we finish, I wonder if we could just maybe maybe invite Kath, if you don't mind, to come and just play um, one of those songs. And we could just ask the Lord, where do you want me to shine my light? And that is also here this week, right here in, in uh, the southwest of England. Who am I called to shine my light to here? Who can I introduce Jesus to? But where do I fit in your big global mission today? What can I be praying for? Who could I maybe be supporting? Or where are you calling me to go to serve myself? So let's just wait on God. Um, I'll just pray now as we, as we begin, and then I'll hand over to Jonathan to see if he feels God calling us to, to move into something more. But Father, thank you that we don't need to be shiny to shine for you. We are smudgy, but we come into your presence and your light transforms our broken bits so that we can be useful for you and you can shine through us. Would you open our eyes this morning as to where you want us to shine our light this week? To our neighbours, Lord, to our family members, to our friends, people across the street, but also in your big global mission, Lord, how can we be part of carrying your light to those places that are unreached, forgotten, overlooked? Thank you, Jesus. Amen.